Good evening. I'm Roy Gain. And this evening, we're going to study an interesting topic, which is how to apply biblical laws to modern life. So I'm going to show a PowerPoint called Instructions for Holy Living, which introduces the nature of biblical law and then some methodology for how to start applying biblical law. And um, we can't get into a lot of examples because that would go far beyond this, but it's going to lay a foundation for the methodology of reading biblical laws and then knowing how to apply them. They all uh, have relevance to us in one way or another because they're in the Bible. And so, but the question is, at what level? Are they ones that we directly apply or are they ones that we uh, learn from on a more conceptual level about the nature of God and his character and those kinds of things? I've discovered that when I present this, uh, people are surprised at how interesting this topic is. You know, uh, you would expect that biblical law perhaps could be academic and boring and all the rest of it, um, but it's amazingly practical, very relevant, and totally fascinating, and really touches every area of our lives. And so people get into this in a big way, and I think you will too. So I'm going to share my screen, and we're going to start. And um, here we have instructions for holy living. And first of all, we have to start with love. All of the Bible is a teaching about love. The word Torah, which is a term that has become used for the five books of Moses, the Pentateuch at the beginning, is the word in Hebrew that means instruction. It's often translated law. And in fact, in Greek in the New Testament, it's referred to as nomos, which is Greek for law. But it really means teaching or instruction. As for example, in the book of Proverbs, when a mother teaches a child on her knee, that is, how do you do things? How do you live? How do you be successful and happy and, um, and, and uh, be protected from problems and dangers and all those kinds of things, which can be on many different levels. They can be you know, physical, financial, social, and so on. So Torah is teaching or instruction. The whole Bible, in fact, is all about this. I had a teacher at the University of California, Berkeley, by the name of Isaac Kikawada, a Japanese scholar who took taught me the languages of Ugaritic and Akkadian, and I heard him give a presidential address at the West Coast Bible Teachers. Uh, well, it was, the, it was a Society of Biblical Literature, which was for Bible teachers, and he presented the three parts of the Hebrew Bible, which are ordinarily referred to as Torah, that is the Pentateuch, and the prophets, which is the former and latter prophets, and then the writings. And he, but, but he said that all of it's based on Torah. You have the Pentateuch, and then the prophets and the writings are all pointing back to that, building on that. And so he said the whole Hebrew Bible is really Torah, 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 which um, some people thought was amusing because he's a Japanese scholar. And you may notice the connection with the sound of Torah, Torah, Torah from uh, the Pearl Harbor attack, where the uh, Japanese coming in uh, radioed back to their superiors. Of course, it meant tiger, 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 tiger that they had surprised the Americans. But in the Bible, Torah, 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 that's a good way to remember it, is really about God's instruction all the way through. And then, of course, we have the New Testament, which is an additional body of instruction. So we have another Torah. This is all teaching about God's character and ways. God's character is what was disputed in the very beginning in Genesis 3 by Satan when he tempted Eve. The whole Bible is about God's character. Can God really be trusted that he really wants the best for us, that he really loves us? And can we trust in his ways, which are beyond our ways? He's much bigger than we are. He has to deal with a lot of complexity and uh, he created us. And so there's a lot that we have to trust about him that we do not know. We have to have a kind of radical obedience, like a child has to trust in his or her parents, not knowing everything, but realizing that the parent has their best in mind. Now, in the Bible, according to the Bible, 1 John 4, verse 8, and it's reiterated in verse 16 of 1 John 4, God is love. And this means unselfish love. It's not just the kind of love which is from Hollywood, which is saturated with self-gratification. It's unselfish love, such as is ultimately demonstrated by Jesus' death on the cross, where he poured out his life for us, everything for us, and his whole character, which is the foundation of his way of governing, 
is all about love. That is the basis of the whole Bible. As Jesus said in Matthew 22, 37 to 40, when he was asked, which is the greatest commandment? He said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and your soul and your mind. This is Deuteronomy 6, verse 5. And then he quoted from Leviticus 19, verse 18. He said, a second is like unto it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. So these are two commandments about love. Love God, love other human beings, but both of these are based upon love. And Jesus said that on these hang all of the law, the Torah, and the prophets. And he was referring to really all of God's revealed will up to then in the Bible, which was the Old Testament. And then, of course, the New Testament is based upon that Old Testament instruction and goes further to reveal the fulfillment of God's promises about sending his son, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, John 3, 16. So the whole, whole Bible is all about love. If you're sitting on a plane or a train or somewhere or chatting with somebody and they say to you, what's the Bible about? They don't want a dissertation or a thesis. They want a soundbite. And you can do it in three words. God is love. And the whole Bible unpacks those three words. God's love is our guide to living. Psalm 143 verse 8 puts it, let me hear of your steadfast love in the morning, for in you I put my trust. Teach me the way I should go. And that way, of course, is going to be guided by God's steadfast love, which then reaches out from us to other people. You shall love your neighbor, your fellow human being, as yourself. God's law is based on love, as we mentioned. Romans 13 verse 10 uh, reiterates that. Everything is based on love. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. The law teaches us how to emulate God's holy and loving character. He is our example. And it says in various passages, starting with Leviticus 11, 44 and 45, reiterated elsewhere, it says that uh, you shall be holy as I, the Lord your God, am holy. And it repeats that in Leviticus 19, verse 2. But then in verse 18, in the middle of that chapter, of chapter 19, it says, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. So how should you be holy as God is holy? How should you emulate his holiness? You don't have his creative power, his glory, all of those different kinds of things, but he gives you a way to emulate his holy character. And that is love as exemplified at the very center of that chapter, Leviticus 19, which is at the heart of the book of Leviticus, which is the center and the heart of the five books of Moses, the Torah. You've got Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus is the third book at the heart of the Torah, and then Numbers and Deuteronomy. So at the heart of Leviticus, which is the central book of the Torah, which is the foundation of the whole Bible, you have, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. First Peter 1, 15 and 16 reiterates this, you shall be holy as God is holy. And he's quoting from Leviticus 11, 44 to 45, which is reiterated then in Leviticus 19, verse 2. So this is for Christians as well. You, Christians, be holy as God is holy. And by doing this, then, we can look at others as God does. Think of the way Jesus looked at people. Jesus was God. God is love. And how did Jesus look at people? We can look at them as God does. Now, for us as fallen sinful human beings, when we look at someone who is, say, um, wealthy or powerful, we may think, oh, I'd like to get close to that person because uh, perhaps I can benefit by being close to them, right? Or if the person is um, attractive, perhaps, yeah, it's nice to be around them. It's nice when you with people that are good looking. And if they're members of the opposite gender, perhaps um, we might even be tempted to say, wow, what I would like to do with that person if I had a chance. Um, or if the person is unlovely, poor, ugly, perhaps, we could be tempted to say, oh, I don't want to have anything to do with them. I can't get anything from them. They're just going to pull me down, and uh, they're, they're kind of disgusting anyway. I'd rather move on and be with other people. Okay, that's how we are tempted to look at people. But how did Jesus look at people? He looked at the rich people, and he felt sorry for them because riches drag them down. Materialism makes it much more difficult for them. Uh, to, to enter the straight and narrow way to eternal life. 
And looking at people who were attractive and beautiful, Jesus would say, wow, how that person can be such a blessing and bring joy to their spouse, to their loved ones. And if he saw a person who was miserable, like, uh, for example, in the, in the parable of the rich man and Lazarus, this poor man, Lazarus, was st- sitting outside the rich man's house, and he had sores, he was poor, he had miserable clothes, and the dogs even licked his sores. It's just totally macabre, disgusting. And Jesus would look at someone like that, or someone who had uh, what we call leprosy. It's really not modern Hansen's disease, but it's um, ancient um, skin disease. He would look at people like that and say, wow, what scope there is for healing and for bringing the revelation of the redemption that only God has to offer, how beautiful they can be shining in my kingdom. You see, God's approach to looking at people is through the prism of love, through those eyes. He sees people through love. And if we do that, if we emulate God, we look at people differently than we would otherwise. Why is love so important? We're not talking about the love of Valentine's Day. That's wonderful. It's good um, to have romantic love. But we're talking about the unselfish love that's demonstrated by Jesus' death on the cross. Why is it so important? Because real unselfish love is the only basis on which intelligent beings with free choice can live in harmony and not destroy each other. Love is as essential to the long-term survival of the human race as food and water are to our short-term survival. Ultimately, we cannot live without love. And that's from my book, Alter Call, which is now republished uh, and translated into Spanish and French under the title, uh, The Sanctuary and Salvation. So it's republished in a um, more international format. But this point that I'm making here is profound because if you read the newspapers, you will realize that we can have all of our physical needs. We can be safe from COVID, perhaps. We can have food and water and air and all those things. And yet we may be victims of a drive-by shooting. We may be, may be victims of some other violence because people hate each other. And there are wars and things where people die as a result of lack of love. The human race ultimately tears itself apart without love. Love is crucial. We need it. Now, the question, what is law? And how does law relate to love? Law can be regarded as the order of justice and right to which people should conform and which judicial authority should enforce. And that is sort of an abstract definition of law in general. Now, laws, of course, are something more specific. And first, we have to consider that there are values and principles that belong to the community's collective conscience. And all of this is part of overall law in terms of a concept a category of thinking that is larger than just individual laws, a list of do's and don'ts, values and principles belonging to the community's collective conscience. Explicit rules, laws, are only the tip of the iceberg of law. Now, it's true that we have a a group of hundreds of people there in our country, the United States, in Washington, D.C., and other countries have have uh, legislators in their countries making laws. That's their business. They make laws. And they've made thousands, tens of thousands of laws. And it takes professional lawyers to keep track of all of them. But even so, they cannot possibly cover all things that could happen in life, which is governed by the larger category of right and wrong, the values and principles belonging to the community's collective conscience. Now, of course, The laws which are enacted by legislatures are no better than the collective conscience of the people who make it. And in fact, society has a lot to do with determining that. And you notice that the Supreme Court and the legislators are very concerned with the flows of thinking of the general society and what we could call political correctness. Now, God is not determined by political correctness in terms of what he advises for us, because he is the creator. He knows what's best. It's not just a matter of people sitting around with their finite uh, experience and knowledge saying what we think is best, especially best for us, of course. God knows what's best for everybody, and he's the creator. So he makes what we could call the manufacturer's handbook, which is the Bible, which gives us instructions which are based upon his infinite wisdom. 
values lead to principles which lead to laws. Now, one of the values, of course, is, of course, love. And one of the principles is you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And then we get laws that come out of it, a lot of laws, uh, protecting people from uh, murder, from getting stolen from, from uh, having someone take advantage of their family by committing adultery and these kinds of things. All of these things are laws that are designed to protect people. And so that this value of love can be played out in the principle of you shall love your neighbor as yourself. That's the way all of this works. There's authority behind biblical law, which is God of Israel. The God of Israel, his name in the Old Testament is usually pronounced by scholars Yahweh. We don't exactly know how to pronounce it. It's the four letters in Hebrew, yud hey vav hey, and we think it's probably pronounced Yahweh, although the traditional pronunciation was lost. He, that is the personal name of the God of Israel. It's badly transliterated in the King James Version, Jehovah. Okay, and so that's a personal name, God, and other kinds of uh, epithets and expressions for him are usually titles for him, but his personal name is Yahweh, and he is the one who gives the source and the authority uh, because he made the laws, and then he's the one who is in charge of enforcing those. He delegates to his people enforcing of the laws to the extent that they can, but even when they cannot, even when they cannot read uh, hearts and minds, or when they cannot, cannot detect uh, actions which are done in secret, he still is able to uh, hold people accountable and judge. His laws, instructions are conveyed through Moses and other prophets. And he delegated that authority to their teachings, which were his teachings, which he conveyed through them. Our moral standard is nothing less than, and this is a very high standard, nothing less than the self-revealed character of God, which is love. Now, that goes far beyond the laws of the Pentateuch that we generally think of as laws. God's self-revealed character covers the entire Bible. It covers all of the narratives. It covers the Proverbs and the Psalms and the prophecies and everything, uh, because God's character is revealed in all of these, his dealings with human beings, his instructions for wisdom, then the singing about God, praise of him, and then the, um, the, the prophets teaching about what not only will happen in the future, but how to relate to our present situation, how to um, have a, an appeal to come back to God. All of these prophetic messages are revealing God's character, which is love. Love includes not only mercy, but also justice. So when we talk about um, love and justice, that's not exactly correct, is it? Because love includes justice. Love equals justice plus mercy. And you can see this in God's self-proclaimed character in Exodus 34, 6, and 7. Moses wanted to see God's glory. God said, you can't see all my glory and live. So he just showed him his backside so he could see a bit of his glory. But then God proclaimed his character, which is his glory. And he said, the Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long suffering and abundant in goodness and truth, and that will by no means clear the guilty. So there we have justice and mercy encapsulated in God's character, which is his glory. And of course, Jesus in John 17 and his final prayer before he was um, captured, before he was betrayed in the garden, he prayed that God would reveal his glory, which he did through Jesus. And that is demonstrating God's justice in showing mercy through Jesus. Jesus accomplishes the justice that we need for God to demonstrate his mercy and save us without God's uh, revelation of justice in Jesus Christ. There would only be mercy in his salvation. There would not be justice. And therefore, and therefore, he would not be conforming to his character of love. And that would be a disaster for the universe because love is the only principle on the basis of which intelligent beings with free choice can coexist harmoniously. If God is not true to his own law of love, which is not only mercy, but also justice, then the fabric of the universe in moral and ethical terms, falls apart. We have to have that love 
which is guiding his creatures. And he has to exemplify that himself. So love equals not only mercy, but also justice. Why is justice so important? Well, for one thing, justice is the boundaries that protect people from each other and from harm that each other could inflict on others. And let me illustrate this. I can illustrate it better than I can explain it. In December of 1955, when I was a baby in Australia, now you, I guess you know how old I am, um, there was a lady in Montgomery, Alabama. She um, had a hat and she wore glasses. Uh, she was a seamstress, pleasant looking lady. And she got on a bus in Montgomery, Alabama. And she um, sat down on the bus and that was fine. She could sit on the bus. But then some people got on the bus with a lighter complexion, a lighter skin color than hers. Okay, you get the drift? And she was supposed to move to the back of the bus because she was darker. And on this occasion, she didn't. And later she said about not her, her not moving, she said it wasn't because she was tired. She wasn't physically tired. She said the only tired I was was tired of giving in. And she was taken before the judge. And the judge looked at Rosa Parks and the judge could have said, you look like a pleasant, harmless enough lady. I'm going to have mercy on you and let you go. Just don't do it again. Is that what Rosa Parks wanted? Did Rosa Parks want mercy? No, Rosa Parks did not want mercy. She wanted justice because there were unjust laws. And she wanted justice. Now, do you understand the importance of justice? What's the use of having mercy if you don't have justice? And if you've blown it and you've gotten in trouble because you've broken the law, you need mercy as well. The combination of justice plus mercy explains why Christ had to come to die. Because when Adam and Eve sinned, God could have said, okay, I'm going to have mercy on you. Let's just forget the whole thing. Don't do it again. But God had already kicked Satan and his angels out of heaven. So that would not have been fair, would it? To hold other beings accountable to breaking God's law of love and yet to let human beings off the hook with just mercy. Because the wages of sin is death, Romans 6.23. And that is eternal death. It's not just the first death. So Jesus had to come to die the second death to save us from the second death, not just the first death. So if God had not paid the wages of sin, which is death through Jesus Christ, the equivalent of the second death, then he could not save us with full justice and therefore with full love. And that's why Jesus had to die. And that's the reason for all of the animal sacrifices, which demonstrate God's justice through Christ's sacrifice. If it weren't for justice, the justice part of love, none of that would be necessary. It also explains the reason for the end time judgment, because God needs to demonstrate his justice when he shows mercy. Now, God's law needs to have absolute standards, and love is an absolute standard. Can you imagine being in an orchestra where the orchestra didn't agree, the members of the orchestra didn't agree that the note A is 440 vibrations per second. I think that's the right number, 440 vibrations per second, if I remember correctly. What if they didn't agree on that? You know, whenever an orchestra starts, the oboe has to play the A because the oboe is hard to tune, so they tune to the oboe. Okay, they tune to that oboe and everyone else chimes in. And you, you know what an orchestra sounds like when it's tuning up. Doesn't sound all that great, but they have to have an absolute standard that they can agree on or it doesn't work. Now, if we don't have absolute standards, there is a, a rabbi who wrote in a book. He said that we have to have absolute standards because in Germany, during the time of the Nazis, they didn't. They had standards that were made according to political correctness. 
And one of those standards was hatred for the Jews. And that was political correctness. And laws were made on that basis. And that led to terrible destruction, terrible suffering. We need absolute standards that is God saying, this is what you must do because I said so. And because it is right, whether it's convenient for you or not, anything else will lead to gruesome results. The purpose of God's law. God reveals God's character to draw us to himself and to prepare us for a holy society. He's teaching us, this Torah instruction is to teach us how to live with Jesus and holy angels when we step through the threshold into the eternal world and live in the new Jerusalem and then the new earth. It's a very different society. And we want to be safe in the new Jerusalem. We want to have a safe neighborhood. We don't want it to be a dangerous place for our children to walk around and our grandchildren. It's going to be a safe neighborhood because everything is going to be based upon his law of love. The only people that he's going to take with him are not just the, quote, nice people, the people who are nice when it's convenient to be nice. He's going to take the people who have committed in this life to live by God's law of unselfish love forever by free choice by their hearts. That's a high standard. Anything less. And, and, and those people are not going to be there because they can't be trusted because sin will arise again a second time. If he takes their people who will take their selfishness with them, even a seed of selfishness, that is lack of love, rebelling against him. So this is a high standard and we need God's transformation. We cannot, we cannot achieve that by ourselves because we don't have that love within ourselves or, uh, naturally. We're going to talk about that a little bit later. So this is to prepare for holy society. God's law benefits people. And Moses was explicit about that. In Deuteronomy 10 verse 13, he said, God's laws are for your good. By guiding them to live in harmony with God's principles, of cause and effect. Now, if you stand on a high building and you say, I don't like that law of gravity. I don't think that I, I should live according to that. I'm going to rebel against the law of gravity. And you jump off the building. <laughs> you know the result. You could be a grease spot on the pages of history. Well, God made other laws besides gravity. It's just the way things work. Not only in terms of physical things, but in terms of society, dynamics between people, uh, health, bodies, all kinds of things. It's just the way things work. It's the way God set things up. And we need to listen to God. He's the creator. He made the manufacturer's handbook. If you have, like I have a Toyota Corolla, and I have to read the manufacturer's handbook, or at least <laughs> yeah, follow its instructions. If I say to myself, you know, I think my Corolla might like some root beer instead of gasoline. And I pour root beer into the gas tank. That's stupid. Anybody's going to say that's stupid. Are they going to call me legalistic for following the rules of the manufacturer's handbook? That's not legalism. That's just common sense. And yet people want to violate God's law and, and say that if you want to live in harmony with God's law, that's legalism. That is total baloney. Excuse the expression. That's stupid. Living in, in harmony with God's laws of cause and effect in his word our common sense. It's the only thing that makes sense. Okay. God's law protects people. Ellen White says in Prophets and Kings, God's law, the law that he has placed around his chosen ones for their protection and obedience to his precepts of justice, truth, and purity is to be their perpetual safeguard. His law is for our benefit. Now, my wife and I, when we were poor graduate students studying at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem, for two years from 1986 to 88, we decided we wanted to see the country of Israel, but we were poor. So we took our backpacks and we got a little, had a little dome tent uh, that we put in my pack and we had sleeping bags and we used public transportation, public buses, which were very cheap. And we travel around Israel. We stayed in hostels and we stayed in, um, in campgrounds and we saw the country of Israel. It was very interesting. On one day, it was a hot day, and we were having to walk for a ways and get to a bus station. And the bus station, we could see it. It was kitty corner across a field. Now, we had to walk straight and then left if we were going to go on the road. But 
I learned in geometry class when I was a sophomore in high school that the hypotenuse of a triangle is shorter than the sum of the two right angles, right? So we decided we were going to take a shortcut and just cross right across the field. Makes perfect sense, right? All right, so we started across the field, but we came across a little sign. And the sign was a wooden sign painted in white. And in black letters, it had just a few Hebrew letters without the vowel pointings. And it said in Hebrew, Mokshim. Now, I didn't know what Mokshim were. And so I thought I better check. So I got out my little Hebrew English dictionary and I found out that Mokshim were landmines. Landmines. Now, I could have said, we could have said, come on. That's restricting our freedom. That sign is restricting our freedom. We're going to go ahead. Oh, yeah, we could have gone ahead. We could have had a blast, right? Yeah, right. We could have been free, right? Six feet under, free from all worry and care. We decided to go the long way. Okay, that's what God's law does. It may be inconvenient, but it is for our protection, and we better pay attention to it. God's law is the divine guide to excellence and moral community for evangelistic purpose. God wants to lavish blessings upon his people to lead others to him. His law reveals sin, which is a departure from love, in order to show the need for mercy and, and restoration. God's law does a lot of very important things. If we don't have the diagnostic device, the standard against which we measure our lives, and we say, hey, things aren't working out right. How come? And we read God's word and we realize, uh-oh, you know, I blew it. I made a mistake. I did something God said not to do and I'm paying the consequences. Okay, I'm really sorry, God, I made the mistake. I should apologize to somebody else if they're involved, and I'm not gonna do that again in the future. Please forgive me. And I accept the forgiving grace of Jesus Christ's sacrifice, and everything is gonna be okay. I may have to pay some, uh, some cost in the meantime, that's just the way things are, uh, but I'll be a lot better off than if I continue in this course. That's the way it works. It's a diagnostic tool. Now, what if we didn't have diagnostic tools for when we're sick? See, we go to the doctor, and one of the most important things we need to know is, what kind of sickness do I have? Do I have the flu? Do I have measles? Do I have COVID? What do I have? I need to know so that we can find out what treatment to apply, right? So the law is a good diagnostic tool. Now, the law is not the treatment. It's not the treatment. If you've broken it, it's an instruction that if you keep it, it's going to help you. It's going to help you have better life and do well and be successful and all the rest of it. But if you break it, it can't help you any more than a diagnostic test can help you. A COVID test is not a COVID vaccine. They are two different things. They have different purposes. And God's law is like the test. It's not like the vaccine. The covenant framework, God's cumulative covenant phases structure the whole Bible. Law functions within the covenant framework, and it's relational. Everything in the Bible is relational because God is love, and love is a relational value that gives a relational principle, which is love God and love other human beings. The whole Bible is relationships, and the basic relational framework that God set up in the beginning and that he reiterates through different phases in the Bible that sets up the whole skeletal conceptual framework of the whole Bible is covenant. There was an implicit covenant in the beginning with Adam and Eve. They broke the covenant, and then he reestablishes it with them, covenant with Noah, and then covenant with Abraham, with Israel, and with then the new covenant. And these are cumulative waves of grace, and then the new covenant is a tsunami of grace, okay? They build upon each other. That one uh, successive covenant wave doesn't wipe out the earlier phases of the covenant, but builds on it. Yes, there are some things that, that are different, but we have uh, a, a new phase that adds to it to a large extent. They're cumulative. So law functions within this covenant framework. We find that the blessings and curses of Leviticus 26 and Deuteronomy 27 to 30 put the law in a covenant framework explicitly because we have uh, there, we have God saying, if you keep these instructions that I'm giving to you, you'll prosper. Everything is going to go well. But if you don't, it's going to go badly. He's very, very explicit. And this is all part of the covenant. Law contributes to the purpose of the covenant to reveal and express God's character. 
And in fact, we can compare ancient Near Eastern trees and Hammurabi's law code, where we discover that the relationship between human beings and their ruler and human beings and their deities is the framework within which stipulations are given within treaties. For example, the great Hittite kings by the names of uh, Hattuzilis and Mursilis and uh, Supiluliuma, you may not have heard of these people, but they were really powerful in their time. They made treaties with lesser kings. And in those treaties, they would uh, identify who the parties to the treaty were. A treaty is a covenant, right? An agreement. Who the parties were, the prior relationships that these parties have had, uh, which is a history of the covenant parties, like my father treated your father well, and so on and so forth. And then we have stipulations, which are laws. What you, the lesser party, have to do for me. Uh, and then we have witnesses and blessings and curses and stipulations for where to place the treaty document, all of these things. These are the different parts of these Hittite treaties, which we have a number of them in the ancient Hittite language. Interestingly, those same different elements of those Hittite treaties are parts of the laws, the, the law code frameworks that we find in the Bible. We find the book of Deuteronomy, for example. Yes, there's the identification of the parties, God and Israel. We find a reiteration in the first part of Deuteronomy of the way God treated Israel, bringing them out of Egypt. And he's the one that they should have loyalty to because he is their redeemer, their deliverer, and the one who took care of them in the wilderness. Then we have the laws, the stipulations, what he expects from them. But it's not just what's good for him, it's what's good for them. And so that's really a major difference between his laws and the laws of the ancient Hittite emperors. And then we have, in the book of Deuteronomy, witnesses. I call heaven and earth to witness against you this day. And we have uh, blessings and curses. And we have the instructions where to place the treaty document, which is the, um, the law of the Ten Commandments to be placed in the, ten, in the ark, to be placed in the sanctuary. And we also have another element, and that is when to periodically read the treaty document, which is God's laws. To be read every seven years. That was another thing that could be in the Hittite treaties. So you see there was a kind of a, a template that was already in existence in the second millennium BC that God used this to demonstrate his covenant to Israel. And this shows that the, uh, tr that the laws, the stipulations are all part of the covenant framework, which is all part of the relational dynamics between God and Israel. And they're based upon grace because God let his people out of Egypt. He saved them already. The covenant is based upon grace. Therefore, the law within the covenant is also based upon grace. God inaugurated covenants and gave laws to people whom he had already delivered. Noah was already saved from the flood, and then God gave him ongoing stipulations. Abraham was already spared from danger while rescuing Lot, and then God established the covenant with Abraham. The Israelites were already delivered from Egypt, as God said, in the beginning of uh, Exodus 20, but just before the Ten Commandments, I have brought you out of the land of Egypt, delivered you on eagles' wings. Therefore, you shall have no other gods before me. See, the law is for saved people, people who are saved already. It's not in order to save them. So God's laws function within the covenant framework of grace. Law keeping does not save anyone. The benefits of biblical law. The character of God is demonstrated through law and theodicy, which is showing God's character. Then we have deliverance and social justice are an important part of God's laws, communal ethics, marriage and sexual morality, beneficial lifestyle, what's good for you, Sabbath and sanctification, and we have illuminations of other parts of the Bible in biblical law. This is very exciting when you read the whole Bible uh, and you look at the later narratives in light of the laws, and you make these connections. For example, in Leviticus 11, verses 29 to 35, you have a whole series of crawlies and creepies and long-legged beasties and things that go bump in the night. There's a bunch of crawling creatures um, that, um, that make things unclean when they're dead. Their carcasses can, if they, if they get on food or or, or um, in, in a drinking vessel or on various things, they make them 
impure, ritually impure, so that they cannot be used or they have to be purified. However, however, there's an exception. In Leviticus 11, verse 36, there's an exception to that. This is something that cannot be made impure, even by these carcasses. And that is a cistern or a spring of water. Why? Because this is a source of impurity, of purity, rather. It's a source of purity. You cannot defile a source of purity. Now, this is all background to Luke 8, 43 to 48. Because a woman with an issue of blood, she'd had this issue of blood for years. And she was ritually impure, according to Leviticus chapter 15. Leviticus 15, 25 to 30 makes it clear that a woman with an issue of blood beyond her normal, normal period was ritually impure. This had terrible consequences for her. She was not allowed to go into the sanctuary courtyard to offer sacrifices. Uh, she couldn't touch anything holy. What she touched or sat on was impure. People would have to be careful being around her. She couldn't have sex with her husband if she was married. It was very, very hard on her. And yet this woman with this issue of blood being impure wanted healing from Jesus. And she believed that if she touched Jesus, she could be healed. But she knew that if she touched him, she would make him impure. So she was in a catch-22. It's a paradox. What's she going to do? So she comes up and she touches just the hem of his garment. She wants just enough touching to receive the healing, but not enough to make him impure. And he turns around and says, who touched me? And she comes trembling. She's trembling. She's afraid because he's going to be angry for making her impure. But he says, don't worry, sister. Your faith has made you whole. Go in peace. And he said, not only that, he said, I felt power go out of me. His healing, purifying power that healed her made her pure, ritually pure, and there was no backwash of impurity to come back and affect it. Why? Because Leviticus 11.36 demonstrates that principle. A source of purity cannot be defiled. Wow, that's exciting. And when we go out, to minister to other people on God's errands as channels of purity and healing in a broken world. We may go into situations that could be regarded as impure, but if we're on God's errand, we don't have to worry about that because a source of purity cannot be defiled. Now, Numbers 15, 37 to 41 also illustrates something additional about Luke 8. And that is there's a law in the Numbers 15 that Israelites had to make a tassel, which is made of linen and wool mixed. And the wool could be dyed. You can't really dye linen. It's going to be white. But you would dye this wool, and you would have a tassel made of that on each of the corners of your garment. Why? So that the Israelites would remember holiness, and that they should live in harmony with God's holy commandments. Now, what's the big deal about mixed fabrics like that? Because mixed fabrics, we're going to talk about this later in the question and answer session, mixed fabrics are forbidden according to Le Leviticus chapter 19. Why? Apparently because they were belonging to the realm of mixtures, which is found only in the sanctuary with priestly garments, the inner veil, these are mixed fabrics. And so God made mixtures forbidden to Israelites outside, that kind of mixtures of linen and wool, so that the sanctuary would be special, except for the tassels on their garments, which were symbols that each of them had holiness as a kingdom of priests and a holy people, Exodus 19, uh, verse 5. So what happened? The woman who touched the not just the hem of Jesus' garment, the word in Greek is the same as the word in the Greek Septuagint translation of Numbers 15, which is the word for one of these tassels, which is a symbol of holiness. And it's a principle in biblical law that holiness is not supposed to come in contact with impurity. So this woman grasped the symbol of Jesus' holiness, and she was impure. But it didn't matter, because a source of purity cannot be, a source of purity cannot be defiled. Isn't that exciting? And we get that from looking at biblical laws. And here's another uh, example, Luke 7, 36 to 40. This is a case of Simon's feast. And a woman came and Jesus was there. The Lord was there. 
at the house of Simon the Pharisee, and Jesus was dining there. But this woman came in. She had an offering for Jesus, a very expensive ointment. And she came and she let her hair down and she anointed his feet and she wiped his feet with her hair. And she was accused in the mind of Simon. Simon said, wow, if Jesus only knew what kind of woman this was or what she's done, he wouldn't let her get near him like, like this. Now, that's an interesting combination. We have the Lord. We have a woman coming, bringing a gift. She lets her hair down. There's an accusation, all right, by a man. And there's a judgment then by the Lord. And the Lord judges this case. And he ends up judging it by a parable that he says to Simon. And he talks about who has loved uh, someone the most, the one who has forgiven the most. And then he says, this woman has been forgiven the most because she's a sinner, but she loves the most because she's been forgiven the most. Therefore, she can go in peace. She is forgiven. Now, what's the background of that? Numbers 5, 11 to 31 has a very strange ritual in biblical law. It's the only case in biblical law where God himself judges the case. A case that ordinarily we would think would be judged by the elders who used to sit at the city gate and would judge the cases, including cases of uh, theft and murder and adultery and all these things. This is a case of suspected adultery. A man suspects that his wife is messing around with some other man, but he's not sure. And he's really disturbed and it's eating away on him and it's destroying their marriage. And so what he can do to resolve the situation is to have God judge the case. Now, feminist interpreters and a lot of people get really bent out of shape because there's only a law about a suspected adulteress, not a corresponding law for a suspected adulterer. So they say this is unfair. Only a woman is treated like this. Ah, why? Only a woman needed this level of protection if she were innocent because the courts were run by men. And a guilty, an innocent woman, an innocent woman could be lynched by an all-male court who may side with a man who suspects his wife. And God says, uh-uh, nope. You, I don't trust you men to judge such a case. I'm going to make sure that a woman gets a fair trial. And he judged that case himself. So it was a privilege. It's a privilege if you're judged by the Supreme Court, right? It's an incredible privilege to be judged by the highest court. And that's what this was, the Supreme Court, the highest court, including, in fact, it was the court of God himself. And what does this mean? The man would bring the woman, brings his wife with an offering to the Lord. The priest would let her hair down. All right, do you see some similarities already with the case of Simon's Feast? A woman coming, a present coming to the Lord, her hair is let down, which shows humility and being completely um, open before the Lord. And then the Lord judges. And here the Lord judges at the sanctuary. And the verdict is either innocent, in which case nothing happens, or guilty. We won't go into the details. There's a litmus test where she has to drink holy water consisting of water plus dust from the floor of the sanctuary, which is holy. And if she's morally impure, holiness and impurity have a bad reaction. It's like a litmus test. But if she's morally pure, purity and holiness are okay. All right. So in any case, God judges the case and it's either innocent or guilty. And if she's guilty, there's bad gynecological effects. She can't have children. And the um, effects demonstrate the verdict. Okay, innocent or guilty. What's the verdict in Luke 7, however? There's obviously a relationship between these two passages. So when we come to Luke 7, what does Jesus say? He doesn't say, say she's innocent. He accepts that she's guilty. She's guilty as charged, but forgiven. Praise the Lord for that, forgiven. So this is Luke 7. Jesus is going beyond beyond the scope of that law of the suspected adulteress in Numbers 5. And that's an incredible gospel message when we put these passages together. Leviticus 1, background to John 20, 17. This is more brief. Uh, Jesus said to Mary in the garden, don't hold on to me for I have not yet ascended to my father. 
This is when he had just been resurrected. Don't hold on to me. I've not yet ascended. He had to ascend. Now, this word ascend shows up in Leviticus chapter 1 because the ascending sacrifice is ola, and that's translated burnt offering. The Hebrew word for burnt offering means ascending. And so what Jesus was saying is, my, I have not gone up to heaven, ascending to my father as the smoke goes up to God from an animal sacrifice to have that sacrifice accepted by my father in heaven. And he went up quickly that day and then came back down and revealed himself to others of his disciples. But between the time of his actual resurrection and the time of his ascension to heaven, he only revealed himself to one person, and that was Mary Magdalene. This broken woman who was the only person that really understood his mission, which was to heal sinners, to forgive sinners, because he had forgiven her and healed her. His mother didn't get it. His disciples didn't get it. Other people, the Pharisees, the religious leaders, they, they didn't get it. Mary Magdalene got it. And she was the one who anointed him for his burial. And so Jesus only revealed himself to Mary, this discouraged, distraught woman. And this shows that Jesus didn't just care about completing his sacrifice, the most important event in human history. In fact, arguably in the history of the universe, because he's saving the universe by demonstrating his love like this for all time. He went out of his way. He interrupted the completion of his sacrifice in order to minister to this woman, Mary Magdalene, as the ultimate good Samaritan. The good Samaritan was busy. He had an agenda. He was on a trip, and he turned aside. He interrupted his trip to minister to someone who was broken, and that's what Jesus has done. And Jesus demonstrates that what he, that's what he does for us. He interrupts what he's doing in the universe, running the universe, to turn aside to help us, to heal us. And then Jesus said to Mary, go and tell your brothers, the disciples, that I'm, uh, I'm alive. So Mary, Mary Magdalene became the first evangelist to convey the message of his resurrection. All right, so that's John 20, verse 17, in light of, light of Leviticus 1, again, from the law of sacrifice in this case. Laws benefit those who keep them. Leviticus 18, verse 5. Okay, you'll, you can live by the law. That's true. If you keep it, it's going to help you. You can live by it. But laws cannot help those who break them, as Paul understood in Galatians 3, 10 to 12. If you uh, smoke five packs of cigarettes for 25 years, and then you quit, okay, nothing can undo the results on your lungs that has happened by now keeping the Surgeon General's um, recommendation, you can't heal what you've done to your body. You need healing beyond that of some kind. Laws cannot help those who break them. Only God's mercy through Christ can remedy failure. We cannot obey on our own. We need Christ and his power to give us the gift of obedience because we do not have love within us. And love is obedience. Obedience, living by love, is a gift of grace received by faith through God's spirit. Romans 5, verse 5. Hope does not disappoint because God's love is poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit, which Christ gives to us. And Galatians 5, verse 6 says, Paul says that the only thing that matters is faith working through love. And how do we get love? which is bringing us in harmony with God's character and therefore with his law of love. How do we get it? Romans 5 verse 5 tells us we receive it as a gift of grace through the Holy Spirit. Now, years ago, years ago, there was someone I needed to love. And um, I stopped loving that person because they hurt me deeply. And it was very difficult, very painful, excruciating. I looked around in my heart and there wasn't any love there. And I have to let you in on a little secret. I'm descended from pirates. My name, Gain, was Gagne, and it was a French name. And on the other side, I've got a lot of British and uh, Irish and all that. But on, the, on this side, it was French. And they were Huguenots, French Protestants. And then they immigrated to England. 
And the line that I'm descended from, those, those French people became pirates. So I'm descended from pirates. And so perhaps because of my genealogy, love doesn't necessarily come naturally for me. Okay? I need help loving. And when I stopped loving that person, there wasn't any love there in my heart. What was I going to do? I prayed to God and I claimed the promise of Romans 5 verse 5. Lord, create love in me the way you created a light in the beginning. And God did. He created love in the heart of Roy Gain. And that love was good. As, as God said, let there be light, and the light was good. And that love stayed and it grew, it remained. Praise the Lord for that. And so when I talk with friends of mine who have left their faith in God, and they've jumped into the ocean of doubt and uh, skepticism, there are sharks out there, right? I prefer to stay on the ship. But I have friends who have jumped into the ocean looking for truth. And when I talk to them about why I still believe in God, I have to cite my experience. Because when I claimed a promise in the Bible, there was somebody on the other end of the line, my cell phone of faith. There was someone on the other end of the line uh, and, and answering that prayer and creating a miracle, a miracle in the heart of Roy Gain. That is a miracle. I know it because I know what was there before and what's there afterwards. It was a miracle of God's grace through the power of the Holy Spirit. God writes his law of love on our hearts. That's how he does it, through the Holy Spirit. Jeremiah 31, 31 to 34. God writes his law on our hearts. And this is the basis of the new covenant. Because God forgives us our iniquities and remembers our sins no more. In verse 34, the second half of the verse. And that's how, that's the basis through the sacrifice of Christ, how he can write his law on our hearts because we accept his grace, which was there before because he loved us while we were still rebels against him. The new covenant relationship results in works of love. Galatians 5 verse 6, faith working through love. Lack of such works means the faith is dead. James 2 26, and God's saving grace is not accepted because faith plus Grace, or I should say the reverse, grace accepted through faith. Grace plus faith equals, equals salvation, right? If you don't have that equation of grace accepted through faith, grace plus faith, you don't have the salvation equation and you're lost. And, and to have the faith that's living faith that works through love. So if the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed, John 8, 36. This true freedom from Jesus is liberation from being a slave to sin as one who practices sin, which is lawlessness. Lawlessness is breaking God's law. Therefore, the freedom that Christ offers is obedience to God's law. Jesus' freedom and obedience are one. How are you going to be free? By being obedient. It sounds like an oxymoron, which is a contradiction of terms, but that's the way it is. And that's in my book, Old Testament Law for Christians. Legalism uses law for a purpose other than that for which it was intended such as to earn salvation, to gain assurance by reaching a minimum standard, or to wield power over other people in order to coerce or condemn them. That's legalism. Legalism is not God's law, which is based on love, God's covenant, which is based on grace, obedience to God's law, which shows loyalty to him by receiving his gift of love, or wanting to learn more about God's law in order to live in more living harmony with him and other people. If people call that legalism, they're wrong. And I think it's funny when people refer to keeping Sabbath as legalistic. Now, folks, I'm a pr pretty driven personality, you know, like type A or type AAA. And so if it were not for God proclaiming from Mount Sinai with thunder and lightning, you shall not work on the seventh day, my holy day, I would feel guilty not working on Sabbath. Okay? But because God says that and he forbids me to work on Sabbath, I never feel guilty not working on Sabbath. Praise the Lord. I have freedom from slavery to work because of God's law. If that's legalism, give me more of it. All right. Now, on the basis of all of that, we needed that background to understand what God's law is about. What are guidelines for applying biblical laws to modern living? And in my book, Old Testament Law for Christians, 
I outline an approach that I, I call progressive moral wisdom. And it's really based upon the um, outline that Paul gives in the book of Timothy, 2 Timothy. The whole Bible provides progressive training in moral wisdom for salvation and service. 2 Timothy 3, 15 to 17. The sacred writings, Paul refers to, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. And this is generic, man of God, woman of God, the person of God. And notice that these sacred writings make you wise for salvation by instructing you in all of these ways. And this includes all of scripture, which includes not only the what we call laws, it includes all the genres of literature, Proverbs, Psalms, prophecies, everything, everything, narratives. Some biblical laws directly apply to modern life. And so we can see how they could directly instruct us. We read and we do. Other laws only indirectly apply to modern life because the institutions or situations that they regulated are gone. Like the sacrificial system or in our culture, leveret marriage, which is brother-in-law marriage. For example, if uh, two brothers dwell together, one of them is married, his wife dies, leaving no children, and the other brother has to marry her, and so on. This is still practiced in Papua New Guinea. I learned from one of my students here at Andrews University from Papua New Guinea, but it's not in modern Western culture like where I'm from, okay? So the laws um, don't apply to the parts of our lives that no longer apply, okay? Law always have a, has a scope of application and applies to it. Now, if you can have a, a scope of application, say, in Berrien County of the state of Michigan, where I live, and suppose the law said that if you take your cat out in a public place, the cat has to be on a leash. All right? Okay. There's no such law, but just suppose. That law doesn't apply to me. You know why? Because I don't own a cat. Not now. All right? I used to have one, but I don't have a cat anymore. So the law doesn't apply to me. So you see, laws have a scope of application. And if some law apply to a, a single person uh, or to a woman or to um, a person of a certain financial status that I'm not, I wouldn't have to obey the law because it just doesn't apply to me, see? Okay, so there's a scope of law. And some laws don't apply to us literally, although we can still learn from them. We can still learn about God's character and what he intends for people and the way he relates to people. How can we make valid indirect applications when a law doesn't apply to us directly? Paul demonstrates the method of responsible analogy, responsible analogy for indirect application. Here it is. For it's written in the law of Moses, Deuteronomy 25, you shall not muzzle an ox when it treads out the grain. Is it for oxen that God is concerned? Does he not speak certainly for our sake? In the same way, the Lord commanded that those who proclaim the gospel should get their living by the gospel. Now, you see, what Paul is saying is that there is an underlying principle behind the law. You shall not muzzle an ox when it treads out the grain. And that is, a worker is worthy of receiving the benefit of their work, even if it's an ox. If it's a human being, you can say the more so, okay? Not the less so. And so if you have a worker for God, a minister for God, who is full-time or part-time working for other people, and therefore they don't have time to earn money to grow crops and get food for themselves in that way, or do other kinds of earning for their living, they deserve to be supported from their work. In this case, it is work of proclaiming the gospel, which people need. It's for their lives. Now, you see, I'm not a farmer. My wife and I grow a garden, you know, and it's very limited. Um, but I make my living through what I'm doing right now, teaching and research that's behind my teaching and writing books and things like that. That's how I make my living. And I get remunerated for what I do, just as other, other people get remunerated for what they do. So responsible analogy looks behind the law to look for what's the principle or the value that is underlying this particular law. And then when we know what's 
the principle, we can apply it to other situations. You see how that works? It makes perfect sense. Now, here's some steps of progressive moral wisdom. First, analyze the law by itself. Look at what it specifically says in its situation. What's its scope? What is it saying? And so on. Then analyze the law within the system of Old Testament laws. How does this apply to, or how does it relate to, other similar laws from which I might learn something about this particular law? Further analyze the law within the context of the ancient life situation. What do we learn from the narratives and other parts of the Bible, even Proverbs and prophecies and even Psalms, about how people were living and how this could relate to their lives within their life situation? Having done that, then analyze the law within the process of redemption. God is leading people to himself by progressively revealing his character to get us back to the high ideals that were there at creation. When everything was just right, there was just a man and a woman married to each other. There was no slavery. There was no uh, servitude. There was, uh, everyone was equal and so on and so forth. He's leading us back towards these ideals uh, progressively. He has to do it progressively because of our brokenness. And if he led us too fast, it would, it would hurt people. Like, for example, if God had done away with all servitude in Old Testament times, people wouldn't have given uh, loans. They wouldn't have given loans for which there were other people that had nothing except their service to give as collateral. And then if they couldn't repay the loan, they would repay it with their own service, with their work, you see? And so God allowed that kind of servitude to keep people alive who would otherwise die if they couldn't receive loans for which they were collateral. You see, that's a, that's a point that God is drawing us back to himself through the process of redemption. And he allows divorce under certain situations. Uh, we don't have the, the ideal of creation. He's leading us back towards that ideal. So analyze the law within this process of redemption. Is this a law that, that we find later in the Bible, God is leading us beyond that uh, to something that is better? Uh, such as, for example, in Galatians 3, we find um, there's neither male or female. There's neither uh, slave nor free. Oh, there's neither slave nor free. Everyone is equal within the church of God's people. And so he's pointing to an ideal of absolute freedom, although he tolerated servitude within the Old Testament laws. Okay, this is an example of looking at the trajectory of redemption and salvation. And then finally, step number five, relate the findings regarding the function of the law in light of all of the preceding steps. Relate those to modern life so that you will have extrapolated the underlying principle, the value, and then even if the uh, law came to you in ancient Near Eastern dress, okay? You have to sort of undress it, reclothe it, but the basic principle is still there. Okay, and then, and then relate to that to modern life. Okay, that is chapter eight of Old Testament law for Christians. Now, here's a hierarchy of principles which helps us to understand how to apply the laws. Overall, as we said, is love. And then we find Jesus reiterating these major laws, love for God, Deuteronomy 6, verse 5, love for humans, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, Matthew 19, verse 18. Based upon those, Jesus said, all of the other laws are covered. And we find the Ten Commandments are all based upon the, that law of love, which is love for God and love for humans. Now, the transition point is really the Sabbath. Sabbath. And I could have and probably should have and will in the future probably extend love humans over to the Sabbath, because the Sabbath is not only about love for God, but also humans, because you have to allow other members of your household to have rest as you do on the Sabbath. So that's really a transition. The Sabbath is crucial and key in all of this. In fact, the Sabbath not only is crucial in God's law for revealing the identity of the lawgiver, okay, it's the one that mentions God and his, his, his identity, to the Israelites. It also encapsulates the principle of love, which covers the whole law. Because we find in Exodus chapter 31, verse 13, God says to his people that the Sabbath, Sabbath is a sign that I, the Lord your God, sanctify you. I make you holy. What does it mean when God sanctifies us and makes us 
holy. What is God's character? Love. What do we find in Leviticus 19, verse 2? You shall be holy as God is holy. In the middle of that chapter, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Holiness as God is holy is based on love. And in 1 Thessalonians 3, verses 12 and 13, it parallels growth in love with growth in holiness, which is sanctification, because they are the same thing. In practical terms, sanctification, growth in holiness, is growth in love, which is receiving the Spirit to pour love into our hearts so that today I'll be more loving than yesterday. Tomorrow I'll be more loving, more sensitive, and more kind to other people than today. You see that? If Sabbath is a sign that God sanctifies us, it's a sign of growth in holiness, which is growth in love. So Sabbath is a celebration of love. And that's encapsulating the meaning of all of the commandments. Now, laws in the process of redemption, I mentioned that God is leading us back to a higher ideal. In the beginning, there was the divine ideal of union between man and woman. God put them together and they were both receiving conditional immortality through eating the, the, the tree of fruit of the tree of life. And so there was permanence. They were not going to die. Permanent union, no divorce. But then came the fall. There, be, there came death. So people would die and then they could remarry after that. By the time you get to Jesus' day, you find a dispute between two different groups of rabbis. The school of, or that is the disciples following, the rabbi Hillel, who was an older contemporary of Jesus, and those following Shammai. Now, Shammai said that the law in Deuteronomy 24, verse 1, the ground for divorce was, there it literally says, um, a matter of indecency, okay, something less than adultery in that context, because an adulteress would be put to death, right? Um, although in Jesus' day, by the time Jesus came along, by the time you get to about AD 30, the Romans took away from the Jews the right to put people to death. And so the only recourse a man would have if his wife committed adultery was to divorce her, right? And the school of Shemai said that this law in Deuteronomy 24 verse 1 means that the ground for divorce is a matter of indecency, okay? When it, when it says uh, ervat devar in Hebrew, it's the indecency of a thing. It's a thing of indecency. That's what the school of Shemai said. But Hillel said, no, what it means is the, the, the ground for divorce is even if she spoiled his dish, even if she burned the porridge, he can divorce her. And this is divorce for any reason. And that's why the, um, the, the scribes and Pharisees came to Jesus and they said to him, can a man divorce his wife for any reason? In other words, do you agree with Hillel or do you agree with Shemot? And Jesus um, pointed them to a higher ideal. And they said, Moses allowed divorce. See? And yes, there was divine accommodation, but Jesus pointed to the creation ideal. And then he reformulated the ground for divorce, and he says, a thing of indecency is only for sexual immorality. And he raised the bar, limiting divorce to protect especially women. So you see what Jesus is doing. Uh, human beings brought the ideal down to a very low level. The laws of Moses brought it back to a higher level. Jesus raised it to an even higher level, pointing towards the elimination of divorce, which we're not ready for yet because we're still fallen human beings. But when we get to the next life, there will be no divorce in heaven. Okay, so that's an example, uh, just one example of how there's a trajectory, a growth in the Bible's re revelation of its laws in the process of redemption. Now we get to a very interesting topic in terms of application of biblical laws. The traditional categories of laws, including for Seventh-day Adventists, Three of these categories, the first three, date back to the early, early fathers, the early Christian fathers in the patristic era. Moral laws are regarded as the Ten Commandments, timeless universal principles governing relationships. And then there's the ritual or ceremonial laws, uh, sacrifices, impurities, and those kind of things, which are ritual types or shadows until the fulfillment at the cross. And then we have 
the civil laws, which applied only under the Israelite theocracy. So they were laws that were governing the people under the government that was ruled by God within that nation. But now that we're not within that nation governed by that theocracy, those laws do not apply. And then there are the health laws, which, of course, Adventists have uh, regarded as very important in addition. And these laws are ongoing because human bodies function the same. Okay, so there we have a very, very clear-cut delineation of what is going to apply. Moral laws, because they're timeless, ongoing principles of relationships. Health laws are going to apply because our bodies are the same. Civil and ceremonial are not going to apply because the ceremonial is fulfilled. It's prophecy, really, ritual prophecy pointing to Jesus' day. That's fulfilled. Civil laws, the theocracy has ended. Okay, so we get two out of four still apply. That makes sense? All right, but it's not quite so simple. Okay, <laughs> categories of law. There is no sharp distinction in the Bible between sacred and secular laws. Now, for Adventists, uh, we tend to have very, a very sharp distinction between sacred and secular. We have uh, Friday evening uh, worship, and we have sundown, and that's Sabbath, sacred time. We come to the end of sac sacred time on Saturday night. We have sundown worship, and then secular. We flip a switch from sacred to secular. Okay. Now, it's true that there is sacred time, and then we, mo we move to, oh, not secular in ancient Israel. It was not secular time. It was perhaps less sacred, but still sacred. Everything is sacred in life for ancient Israel. So there's no sharp distinction because everything is sacred in holy living when you're in, the, in a covenant with the holy God. That's why we have religious laws of Exodus 22 and so on and so forth and 23 in context primarily relating to secular life. So you can see, hey, wait a minute. These are religious. Those are secular. That's not the point. The point, it's all part of holy living. And these religious laws, um, maybe more explicitly relating to our relationship with God and what we do in worshiping him and so on, but everything is holy. The mixture of laws in Leviticus 19 um, is indicating that we should keep all of God's commandments. Now, the mixture of these laws has confused scholars because you, you get so many different kinds of laws all thrown in, greater mixture than anywhere else. And yet the point is, just keep all of them. They're examples of all the different types. And uh, it's not for you to really sort them out and say, I keep this one, I keep that one. Now, it's true that we cannot keep all of them, and we're going to talk about some of that. But, but in a larger sense, we do, because we keep the underlying principles and we learn from them. We have a holistic approach to life under God. We don't find that in his laws he's saying, do this one, don't do that one. For example, the health laws don't say, do this, and that's going to be good for your left bicep, you know, or your right pectoralis uh, muscle. Um, you know, so you have a cafeteria approach. I'm going to be vegan. I'm going to, I'm going to do this and I'm going to, I'm going to jog uh, five miles a day and so on. Uh, but yet I'd still like to keep my cigarettes and not like to puff on some marijuana once in a while. No, it's not like that. You don't walk through the cafeteria of God's law and choose. I want this one. I want that one. I want that one. You have to have all of them. And God says, if you keep all of my laws, you'll have none of these diseases. It's not that we choose one or the other. And that makes perfect sense because we are a continuum, body, mind, and, and spirit. We're a continuum. Everything that you put into your body affects your mind and vice versa. The things that we put into our mind affect our bodies. Um, you can be living according to all kinds of laws of health and going through a miserable relational situation because you've caused faults that have led to the breakup of your home. And you can be under terrible stress and you can have all kinds of health problems resulting from your stress even though you're doing all of the other health things. You see, that's just an example. We're, we're all one. God gives us holistic health. That's the way health works. Now let's look a little more closely at moral laws. Any command that God gives is relevant to the divine human relationship. So that means that anything that God commanded the Israelites, whatever category you could attribute it to, was a moral law in that larger sense. Okay. The Ten Commandments are examples of moral laws, but they do not encompass all of moral law. There are other moral laws in the Bible, such as 
do not oppress an alien. That's clearly moral. It's ethical, but it's not one of the Ten Commandments. It's based on the principle of love, which is behind the Ten Commandments. Leviticus 19.11, you shall not lie to one another. Yes, the Ninth Commandment in, in Exodus 20, Deuteronomy 5, says that you shall not bear false witness. It's based on the same principle of the underlying principle of honesty. You can bear false witness, of course, by your gestures, by your looks, not just by saying something. But Leviticus 19.11 is the explicit law against lying. And that's not in the Ten Commandments. Okay. The Ninth Commandment is especially about court situations of bearing false witness in which you could um, you could uh, destroy somebody else by falsely accusing them, the way Jezebel had Naboth falsely accused and thereby had him destroyed so that she and Ahab, her husband, could take over his vineyard. All right, so the Ten Commandments are examples of moral law, but they're not the sum total of moral law. And we have other moral laws that are, in fact, elsewhere in the laws of Moses. They are not obsolete. They're interlinked with the Ten Commandments. We cannot extricate them from each other. So it's it's very, very, very crucial that we look at the other laws in the so-called laws of Moses, the Pentateuch. They're not just laws of Moses. They're laws of God. And God says, I'm going to give you words to speak to the people, and they need to take these as my words. You're just my mouthpiece. He made that very, very clear. And in fact, when Jesus cited which is the greatest law, he didn't cite the Ten Commandments. He cited Deuteronomy. See, Deuteronomy um, 5, verse 6. You shall love, or is it 6, verse 5? No, it's 5, verse 6. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul. And then he cited Leviticus 19, verse 18, which is not in the Ten Commandments. It's in the other so-called laws of Moses. Now, the ritual laws regulated the ritual system at the sanctuary or temple. And through these rituals, People interacted with entities ordinarily inaccessible to the material domain, which is God or sin or impurity through those rituals. People interacted with entities um, so that when the high priest, for example, put, put sins on the live goat for Azazel, say, the sins are symbolically, metaphorically there. You can't see them, but, but they're there. And people interacted with those entities and sent them off into the wilderness. And when people gave sacrifices to God, they interacted with God through those, um, through those rituals. They didn't see God's hand let down from the side, sky to take their gifts, but yet they were interacting with God. And that was very, very significant. We can learn from that about how we interact with God and how we worship. The ritual laws, including regarding the festivals, no longer apply because the sanctuary temple institution is gone. It's not just because the sacrifice is pointed forward to Jesus, and therefore he came and those shadows that applied no longer apply. It's because the whole system is gone. Nobody can keep the festivals today. No Jews can keep the festivals. They're gone because there's no authorized priesthood or temple or anything like that. And sacrifices were an integral part of those festivals. You can see that in Deuteronomy 28 and 29. They no longer apply because the whole system is gone. And in the New Testament, in the book of Hebrews, our faith is directed toward the heavenly temple where Jesus is ministering for us in the heavenly temple. And so that's very, very significant. That's why the ritual laws no longer apply, including, including the, uh, the, the rituals about the Day of Atonement. See, the Day of Atonement pointed forward to a time beyond when Jesus came uh, and was there in AD 31 and was sacrificed. Pointed forward to a time way in the future, which the prophecy in Daniel identifies with the end time. And we know from elsewhere it comes in 1844. And then the, uh, the, 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 the fall festival of the, um, the harvest festival, Feast of Booth's so-called Feast of Tabernacles is even later. It's representing a time even later than the Day of Atonement, perhaps pointing forward to the ultimate ingathering of redemption and the marriage supper of the Lamb and all of that. So these are not fulfilled prophetically as the spring festivals were. You had um, 
Passover and unleavened bread and Pentecost were fulfilled when Jesus was here in AD 31. But the fall festivals are not fulfilled at that time. And yet, and yet we are not required to keep those because the whole system is gone and because we look to Jesus where he is now. Now, it's wonderful to celebrate um, Passover and those things, as I have in the United States and in the land of Israel with Jewish people. We can learn a lot from those traditional celebrations, which don't have the animal sacrifices, and therefore they're not the biblical celebrations, but yet they draw upon them. We can learn a lot from them, but they are not fulfilling the biblical requirements, and they're not requirements for our salvation. Circumcision no longer applies under the universal new covenant. Because under the new covenant, according to Acts 15, there's no distinction between Jews and Gentiles. You don't have to become Jewish in order to enter the new covenant. So, you know, you can get, you can have your baby circumcised for other reasons, but it's not going to be a theological reason like that. There are ritual laws. Not all ritual laws were fulfilled at the cross. The autumn festivals remained. And that's what we just pointed out. But Christ moved the focus of worship to the heavenly temple. Ritual laws, however, continue to teach us the nature and character of God and mankind, how he is holy and pure and perfect, and we're impure. So there are all kinds of laws of purities, how they had to guard themselves against certain impurities. Certain impurities were permitted. They had to bury their dead. They had to um, participate in what would bring about um, offspring, uh, sexual reproduction, and becoming pure in that way because um, the impurity was all about the birth to death cycle of impurity. Um, that um, that is the cycle of mortality, the birth to death cycle of mortality that results from sin, and that mortality was represented by the impurity, and those impurities had to be kept separate from holy things such as the sanctuary and s- sacred tithe and things connected with it. And we learn from that about the difference between the holy, immortal God and fallen, mortal, sinful human beings. But it doesn't mean that we have to practice those things because we don't have God residing, his Shekinah presence residing in a literal earthly tabernacle on earth. His sanctuary is in heaven. We cannot defile it by our uh, physical state. And all of us are impure if we've ever participated in a funeral, for example. We have not been purified by the ashes of the red heifer. We're all impure, and it doesn't matter anymore. We don't have to have deacons and deaconesses standing at the door of the church when we're going to have the Lord's Supper and asking people very personal questions like, um, well, uh, what did you do last night? Or what time of the month is it? You you get my drift? Okay. Uh, We don't have to have that concern for impurity. And some parts of the world, I've heard Christians, even Adventists, think that um, women shouldn't be on the sacred holy platform. Look, our sanctuaries are not, they're like synagogues. They're not like the ancient temple. The ancient temple was a place to keep people out of because God's presence was literally there. We come and we pack as many people in as we can. And yes, they're sacred in the sense that We want the presence of Jesus to be with us as he's among us, whether there's two or three people. It's sacred in that sense as a meeting place with Jesus. But the laws of ritual impurity do not apply anymore. If they did, we couldn't come in there because we're we're all impure. Okay, male and female. Therefore, we shouldn't discriminate against women and pick on them. That's what always happens, right? Picking on women um, because we're all impure. It doesn't matter. Okay, not all of the ritual laws were fulfilled at the cross. Christ moved the focus of worship. Ritual laws continue to teach us the nature and character of God and mankind, and also the dynamics of divine human interaction. How can we, we can be saved by Christ's sacrifice, demonstrating justice and mercy for us. God's plan of salvation through Christ, which is a whole other course, not just PowerPoint. That's another whole course, that God's plan of salvation through Christ. Ritual laws are indicators. Uh, We have indicators sometimes that a law is ritual and temporary if it's dependent on the sanctuary or temple infrastructure and doesn't exist earlier, such as circumcision. Okay. Well, wait a minute. Circumcision does not depend on the sanctuary temple, and it doesn't, although it did exist earlier, but the things that did have dependence on the sanctuary temple and didn't exist earlier, like 
the animal sacrifices that were specifically according to the laws in the temple. Although other sacrifices did apply outside the temple, those things within the temple no longer apply. Okay. And if there's a ritual remedy for violation, such as, for example, if you are impure and you have to bathe, you know, wash yourself to overcome that impurity, if there's a ritual remedy for that violation to get your purity back so that you can contact holy things, then that is part of ritual law. That's temporary. That doesn't apply to us. Or if its application is removed by the New Testament, as in the case of circumcision, which is not dependent upon the sanctuary or temple, okay? It existed earlier, but yet it was removed as a requirement for salvation by the New Testament, okay? Now, of course, as a requirement for salvation for God's covenant people, Romans 2 makes it very clear that those outside the covenant could still be, fa be saved as a law unto themselves if they were faithful to God's higher principles, Civil laws exemplified timeless or moral or ethical principles within the ancient Israelite context. Exodus 21, verse 12. Anyone who strikes a man and kills him shall surely be put to death. Okay? There is a law from the laws of Moses, but it's giving an example of the sixth commandment and its application. You shall not commit murder. Okay? And here, if a person commits murder in a certain way, they receive the penalty. And the penalty is not in the Ten Commandments. By the way, that sixth commandment is you shall not murder. Uh, the, the King James Version says you shall not kill. That's not entirely accurate because killing was legitimate to kill sacrifices, to kill animals for food, to, um, to kill for self-defense in some cases, to kill if there was a person guilty of a capital crime. They could carry out capital punishment. So you shall not kill is misleading. Now, recently I've seen the argument that in Numbers chapter 35, the laws of the cities of refuge, that the word retzach in Hebrew, which is the same word you find in Exodus chapter 20, for you shall not kill, for you shall not murder, that word retzach is used in Numbers 35 of a person who might be guilty of murder or might not. They're, they're guilty of manslaughter. They've killed somebody, but it may not be uh, murder. It may be accidental. And that word is applied to that person as well, okay? Because they have to have a court to decide whether that's the person is innocent or guilty. And so the argument goes that if murder is not necessarily first degree murder there, that therefore, back in the sixth commandment, it means you shall not kill in the broader sense, not just commit murder that is first degree murder. That is wrong. The reason why it's wrong is because the um, case of the accident in Numbers 35 doesn't apply in the sixth commandment. God isn't prohibiting an accident. He's prohibiting ratzach, which is intentional murder. Uh, it's not a, a law against accidents. So drawing from that meaning in the context of Numbers 35 and then applying it, plugging it in, to um, Exodus 20 is not legitimate methodology. Okay, so here's an example of application within the ancient Israelite context. It contextualizes the sixth of the Ten Commandments, you shall not murder. And the law, notice, is like a skeleton of a story. Okay, anyone, plug in the name, who strikes a man, you know, whatever the circumstances, kills him, shall be put to death. Okay, so it's, it's really like a little mini story. Every law is like that. Temporary aspects of civil laws include penalties administered under the ancient Israelite judicial system, which no longer exists. Regulation of institutions that no longer exist, such as leverage marriage, debt servitude, ancient land ownership, cultural conditioning, affecting specificity of modern applicability to varying de degrees. For example, there's a law um, that says if your neighbor is ox or a donkey gets out and they're wandering around loose, you should take them back to their own owner. Now, my neighbors don't have any oxen. Okay, I have a, I have a, a neighbor who's a veterinarian and she does have a couple of donkeys. <laughs> I love the sound of those donkeys, you know. All right, so, uh, but she has llamas, she has other animals and 
but but what if what if one of her animals other than an ox or a donkey gets astray? Uh, should we take those llamas or whatever back? And that has happened, by the way. Um, uh, my wife uh, and I have found some of those animals getting out and wandering around. Should we take them back, even though it doesn't say uh, that animal in the law? No, look, these are examples in the law, and you're supposed to fill in the blank. The Israelites knew that they could have animals other than oxen and donkeys. They could have sheep and goats. They could have camels or whatever. And you're supposed to take them back to their owner. It's a principle behind those examples. Okay. But there can be cultural conditioning. Okay. And so, for, for example, if somebody's car gets lost, all right, not their donkey that they ride on, but their car that they ride in is lost. And you find their car. They've lost their car. Well, put the owner back in touch with the car if you know how to do it. You see, there's the cultural conditioning that applies. Exodus 21, if a man uncovers a pit or digs one and falls to cover and fails to cover it and an ox or a donkey falls into it, the owner of the pit must pay for the loss. He must pay its owner and the dead animal will be his. This could literally apply today, but most of us do not have oxen or donkeys. The underlying principle applies. We are liable for damage to property of others resulting from our neglect. Okay, and that can apply in other ways. Now, health laws. Health laws, we think of health in terms of you keep this law so you can be healthy. Okay, but none of the health laws had health motivations in the Bible except for one. There's only one. Most of them had other motivations. Disposal of excrement, avoid indecency. Now, it's true. That's that kind of hygiene, sanitation is going to keep people from getting sick. And it's why the Jews, in fact, they would wash their hands, they would dispose of their excrement. And in the Middle of Ages, in the Middle Ages, when what a third of the population of Europe died from Black Death, bubonic plague, which was carried by fecal contamination, carried by rats, the Jews didn't die because of these kind of laws. But the original reason in the Bible was not a health reason, because they didn't really understand all of that. Impure persons put them out of the camp. That's ritual purity. All of these things, uh, guarding against ritual impurity and, and remedying that, okay? And furthermore, going on, no marital intimacy during a woman's period. It's the flow of blood, okay? They didn't know about cervical cancer that could result. Uh, impure animal carcasses, ritual impurity. No eating meat with the blood. Life is in the blood. They didn't know about all the bad things necessarily that could happen from eating blood. No eating suet or fat belongs to God. No eating, and so on and so forth. You see, all these are different reasons. There's really only one law. One law has a health reason. And that is, I don't know if it's in my PowerPoint even. <laughs> it's the commandment in Exodus 23 about the Sabbath. Because on the Sabbath, I think it's later in my PowerPoint, you refresh yourself. Even the ox and the donkey refresh themselves. That's a health benefit that they gain from the Sabbath. But the health reasons are not the ones given to the others. But modern science demonstrates the health reasons. During World War II, American servicemen in the South Pacific were supplementing their rations by catching creatures that they caught in the sea and eating them. They weren't trout or salmon, like back home in Wisconsin or Michigan. And sometimes they got sick and sometimes they died. So the American military contacted an ichthyologist, and that is a fish scientist in California, and asked, what is a general rule of thumb so that we can just tell them a simple way that our servicemen can know this fish is safe to eat or not? And the ichthyologist said, the rule is if they have scales and fins, they're always safe to eat. That's the biblical rule. So it happens that ichthyologist was a Seventh-day Adventist, so he knew the rule. But he was also saying hard science as well. Modern science provides health reasons. God provides for holistic health through keeping all of his laws. Laws are in multiple categories. Sabbath laws fit under all four categories, two of which still apply. Okay, this is like if you have four hats on your head. If you have four hats on your head and you take off two hats, you still have a hat on your head, right? Yeah. And in fact, in this case, you have two hats. Two still apply. The Sabbath, unlike the festivals, Sabbath rest preceded the need for ritual types, does not depend on an earthly sanctuary or temple system. 
See, the Sabbath was the birthday of the world. You can't change a birthday. Nobody can change the Sabbath. That's total fiction. You can't change a birthday. It's a historical event. And so it was around even before sin came. And the festivals and all these types pointing forward to Jesus' redemption all came after the fall into sin. They weren't even needed before the fall into sin. And Sabbath is before that. So the Sabbath doesn't depend on an earthly sanctuary or temple. Sabbath fits in all four categories. Moral law, involving the relationship with God, because it's pledging allegiance to him as the creator. It was, it was honored in the ceremonial system because there were special sacrifices on the Sabbath, according to Numbers chapter 28. And in Leviticus tw chapter 24, the changing of the bread of the presence, the so-called showbread, was on the Sabbath. And furthermore, it was honored in the civil laws because in Numbers chapter 15, 32 to 36, a man who was gathering sticks on the Sabbath day was condemned and stoned to death because he was breaking a law. And he was condemned under the judicial system of the theocracy, which was the civil system. And then the Sabbath, as I mentioned, is also a health law because in Exodus 23, it provides refreshment even to animals. So the Sabbath fits under all four categories. Now, the civil law penalty no longer applies. Stoning. We can't stone people for breaking the Sabbath. And then the other one, which is the uh, ceremonial uh, system, that system doesn't exist. But we still have the moral relational aspect, and we still have the health law. Okay, so Sabbath is ongoing. The new covenant maintains Sabbath rest, reaffirmed by the example of Jesus himself. Now, there are those uh, scholars, including evangelicals, who say, we don't have to keep the seventh day Sabbath because nine of the Ten Commandments, nine, are reiterated in the New Testament, all except for the seventh day Sabbath. They're wrong. Yes, the nine are explicitly referred to, you shall not do this, you shall not do that. The Sabbath is reaffirmed in the New Testament by nothing less than the example of Jesus himself as he created Sabbath in the beginning. It's that special. It's not just words. It's by God's example that he reaffirms the Sabbath. Now, if Jesus were about to do away with the Sabbath, why would he invest so much risk in reforming the Sabbath, remodeling it? If you're going to tear a house down, are you going to spend a lot of money remodeling it? That doesn't make any sense. We got, Jesus was remodeling the Sabbath, not just to tear it down, but to keep it. That makes perfect sense. Laws in multiple categories. Pro prohibition of marital intimacy during a woman's period. Okay, in Leviticus 18 and Leviticus 20, it's categorically forbidden. You don't have sex when it's your wife's period. Okay? And does this apply? Well, there it's a moral law. Among other moral laws, you look in those chapters. The other laws in those chapters are about adultery, um, incest, bestiality, against homosexual practice, all these things. They're all moral laws in those contexts. And in Ezekiel, he places this, he refers to this within the context of moral laws. That's Ezekiel 18, verse 6. Leviticus 15, 24 has a ritual remedy for inadvertently breaking this commandment, which would be if it happens accidentally. You know, you start having sex and then, oops, didn't realize her period has started. Then for the ancient Israelites, there's a ritual remedy, which includes washing. Um, but that doesn't mean that the basic law itself isn't there because this law is applying in not only ritual law, but also moral law. It's basically moral law, but for inadvertence, there is a ritual remedy because it has ritual consequences that if a person became ritually impure in ancient Israel in that way, they couldn't contact holy things. So this is another case of laws in multiple categories. Fits under both moral, moral and ritual law. Here's another one. Prohibition of eat, eating meat without draining blood at slaughter from respect for life. In Leviticus 3.17 and so on and so forth, this shows up in the New Testament, because it's basically moral, but it's also ritual and health, okay? So in Genesis 9, verse 4, God gave permission to eat meat 
to Noah and his descendants after the flood to enrich their diets, but he never gave permission to eat the blood with the meat because the blood is, has to be drained out at the time of slaughter. And that's what Leviticus is reiterating for the Israelites. It's not just for the Israelites. It's for all human beings because it's already there in the laws of Noah, which for, uh, for all human beings, because everyone is descended from Noah. In Ezekiel 33, it's a violation listed with moral faults to violate that one. And in Acts 15, 20 and 29, it's prohibited for Gentile Christians to eat the meat with the blood. So this is something that if you want to be a Christian, let alone, um, you know, a Seventh-day Adventist, um, then this is a rule that we need to keep. That means that uh, it doesn't mean that we have to keep all of the rabbinic laws. They kosher their meat by getting out any of any of it uh, that remains in the blood, in, in, the, in the body. They get rid of that blood by roasting or by salting to get every molecule of blood out. That's not the biblical requirement, which is only draining it till it stops. It's like draining the oil out of your car till it stops. You don't have to go in and wipe all the pipes inside the engine of your car. Just drain it till it stops. Now, I'm vegetarian, so I don't have to worry about that. But there are many Adventists that eat meat and don't realize that this is an absolute moral law of respect for life based on the principle of respect for life, which is behind the sixth commandment, you shall not murder. And this is prohibited for not only Jews, but also Gentile Christians in Acts 15. Respect for life is a very, very important principle, and that is for us as well. Now, here is a criterion for application of biblical law. And this is drawing what was said together about the nature of biblical law, about its being based upon love, the hierarchy of principles, the methodology of the five steps by looking at all of these how can we boil it down to a simple rule of thumb, like that rule of thumb that the ichthyologist gave to those servicemen, which was, and service women, which is, um, if, the, if the fish has, or the creature has scales and fins, it's okay to eat. What is a rule of thumb when we come to a biblical law or policy in the New Testament? Because we have policies which are given in the New Testament that are like the laws of the Old Testament. And here it is. I boiled it down. A law should be kept, should be kept positive to the extent that its principle can be applied unless the New Testament removes the reason for its application. Now, let me unpack that. I think we know to the extent that its principle can be applied. Okay. So we can't literally apply the law of leveret marriage, brother-in-law marriage. Okay. So if... Um, if my brother, if I were not married and, and I was living with my brother and he had a wife and his wife died and didn't leave children, then uh, would I have to marry uh, his, 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 his widow? Okay. And the answer is no, we don't have to do that in our culture. Uh, but there are principles behind it. And the principles refer to respect for the legacy of the dead, which are carried on by the line of the descendants. And also, caring for widows. And in the New Testament, there's an, another way to care for widows. And that is looking out for them, providing for them in material ways with material support from donations uh, to the church and so on. A different way to fulfill the principle that's under, underlying those biblical laws. Okay. So it's not knee-jerk obedience. It's not just read and do. You know, some people think, oh, you know, I'm going to be real true to the Bible. I'm just going to read and do what it says. And then they can give you examples of, of cases in which they're doing that. And maybe you're not, you're, you're out of line and you should follow their example. And they have the truth. <laughs> My answer to that is Deuteronomy 25, 5 to 10. Uh, do you follow or should you follow or should everybody follow the law of leverage marriage, for example, in our culture? And the answer is no. In fact, if we did literally follow a lot of those laws in the Bible, we would be breaking other principles um, on the law, and we would be bringing disrepute upon God's people and upon his law. We have to apply the underlying principles all together, together. And that's why Paul said that it's wisdom for salvation. Wisdom involves not just one thing, not another. It's not a case of lists 
but the whole picture, putting it all together. So it works together for good to those who love God. All right. Criterion for application. The principles underlying the Old Testament, according to Gordon Wenham, and he's right. The principles underlying the Old Testament are valid and authoritative for the Christian, but the particular applications found in the Old Testament may not be. And he's absolutely right. Summary. With what shall I come before the Lord? He has told you, immortal, what is good and what does the Lord require of you, but to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God. And that is it, to do justice. Now, notice there in that last slide that there are three things, three things that are in the... Um, saying of Micah 6 verse 8, what God is saying to him. What does the Lord require? Three things. Do justice, love kindness. That's mercy. What's the combination of justice and mercy? That's love. So do, do, do love, um, which is love your neighbor as yourself. Also love God. And to walk humbly. That's the third part of love, is to be humble. And Jesus demonstrated those to a supreme degree in himself. He came to give us justice, to teach us justice, to have mercy upon us, all because of his love. And he humbled himself to become one with us, Philippians 2, verse 8, to become a human being, not only to the point of death, but death on a cross, so that God's love could be manifest to save us, for God so loved the world, uh, so that we could have eternal life. All right, so that's the end of that. Now, there's, I just want to check my memory here and look up a, a very important verse. Um, and that is when Jesus says, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart. I want to just check that verse. And that is Deuteronomy. Is it four verse six? Uh, no, it's not. It's six. Is it six verse four? That's it. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. So I was right the first time I said <laughs> Deuteronomy 6 verse 4. And then I thought it might be Deuteronomy 5 because that's where the Ten Commandments are reiterated in Deuteronomy. But that is Deuteronomy 6 verse 5. I just want to make sure that you all get that straight.